So usually we'll start um, pretty soon here. Good evening, friends. It's good to see some of you hopping on here. We're just gonna wait a few minutes as more guests chime in. It's exciting to see the list just keep growing. Well, friends, my name is Kelly Lipensky and I'm the Director of Congregational Ministries at First Presbyterian Church in Morristown, New Jersey. And it's great to see some new names in our participant list here checking in. It's so wonderful to be able to connect with you all. This is the Unsimple Truth, which is our Zoom webinar that happens on the first Monday of each month from 7 to 8 p.m. I'm sitting at my kitchen table in Riverton, New Jersey, and I'm joined by Beth Douglas, who will be moderate, moderating our conversation tonight. She's in Princeton, New Jersey. And we are so grateful for our guest tonight, Amanda Moots, who joins us from Tacoma, Washington. Yeah. So thank you so much for being with us in the completely different time zone all the way out west. We're really grateful for your presence and your ministry. And Amanda works for World Vision. She is a grassroots organizing manager. Did I get that right? Is that the official title? You did, you got it. Okay, okay. I, I, in my mind, I've been mixing up the words and putting them in a different order um, throughout. But she's a grassroots organizing manager at World Vision. And we're gonna learn more about what that means tonight. Um, but first of all, as, as more people sign in, um, I just wanna let you all know that this is a live webinar. So we are talking to you in real time. It's not pre-recorded. Um, and this will also be archived because a lot of people will also be watching this on our website for the weeks and months to come. And this is part of our spiritual formation series online as we have great conversations about what it means to be a faithful disciple um, of Christ right in our different contexts. So in case you haven't Zoomed before, I wanna let you know about two key features. If you look just down below at the bottom of your screen, you should see uh, two key buttons that are important for you. One is the chat button, which is just looks like a little chat bubble like you would see in comics. And that is for anyone who's watching this live right now. This is for you to have conversations with each other. And I really encourage you to do that. Um, it may feel awkward at first, but this is really a time when you get to engage and say, wow, I've never heard this before, to really make this a dynamic experience for you all. I think it's really great to have conversations with each other and to bounce ideas off of each other. This doesn't interrupt the webinar at all. This is actually makes it more interactive, more dynamic and memorable as well. And then also, I wanna definitely invite you, another thing at the bottom of your screen, you see two chat boxes back to back, that icon that says Q&A. We would love for you to shoot Amanda or Beth or myself any questions at any time throughout this webinar. And we would love to answer those at the end of our conversation. Or even we could, might even weave them into our conversation depending on the topic we're on at the moment. This is also, I really encourage the Q&A even more than the chat. The chat's great, but the Q&A is really how you can get in touch with us in real time immediately. Um, if something piques your interest or if something challenges you, please let us know. We would love to engage with you and dive into that as well. So I wanna introduce our guest, Amanda, a bit more. Um, I'm so grateful for uh, just her connection to Beth. Beth used to also work with World Vision. And so they have uh, some shared language and a shared background there. Um, so I'm gonna hand it off to uh, Amanda in just a little bit, but before I do a brief intro on Amanda, she came to know God in high school from our conversations with her earlier and was in an evangelical free church in the 90s. And so for her, her idea of ministry, she said, was a bit, uh, a bit confined to the idea that, right, um, for a woman to be in ministry, it was not so much at the pulpit or directly engaged. It was probably more through a side door. So her example is seeing, you know, women in ministry, perhaps, you know, you married a pastor and that's how you were involved in leadership or you did a Bible study, led a Bible study on the side, all good things, but also didn't know that women could be in ministry directly from the beginning, which I think is just an incredible transformation because here she is uh, leading so well within ministry. And so then she had an internship, a year long internship with Inner Varsity Urbana. 
where she was really involved in urban living and ministry. And she said, quote, that was my first real upside down experience where I was living with neighbors who were in poverty. And that's where God really expanded Amanda's level of care for her city, for her country, for the world, and especially in college. That's when she began to feel the call to ministry and mission then. And so she was talking with people about what it means to be involved in domestic poverty issues. And I know a lot of you watching tonight are involved in missions and have a experience with our mission partners locally in places like Camden, uh, where we see poverty more readily. And so Amanda was really wrestling with these questions and what does it mean to follow Christ? And how can I do that faithfully within this urban context? Um, and so this is where she began to zero in on advocacy and shalom and peacemaking. Um, and especially she mentioned kind of this Old Testament uh, narrative where we see in the Old Testament how it's human nature to move sometimes towards division and exclusion and forgetting others. And yet in the Old Testament, we witness some radical things of peacemaking, of truly being love for others, being God's presence in your community, where there's something like Jubilee, which is where debt was forgiven. Um, some of these radical notions of caring for each other and carrying each other's burdens. So um, Amanda, could you take it away from there after this internship? Um, and what, what that led you towards eventually working with the California Senate. Yeah, well, thank you for that wonderful introduction. And it's so good to be with you guys um, from the other side of the country. So um, just thrilled to, to be able to converse with you guys and share some of my story. Um, maybe I'll start with a, quickly just sharing a little bit more about um, I'll go a little backwards, share a little bit about what I currently do and then kind of jump into Kelly's question about how I got there, um, just to help you guys to orient you to what my work looks like um, now and how they got connected with me. Um, but I, so what I actually do is like Kelly said, I'm a grassroots organizer for World Vision. Um, or I'm grassroots organizing manager, I manage the team of, of organizers. And that can be a bit of a confusing phrase and most people don't know what that really entails. Um, and so what that looks like is that I get to mobilize our World Vision partners. For those of you who aren't familiar with World Vision, we're a Christian humanitarian organization. We work in close to 100 countries around the world helping communities um, lift themselves out of poverty. And I get to mobilize our donors and partners who are primarily U.S. Christians to create relationships with their members of Congress to advocate for funding and for policies that will improve the lives of those living in extreme poverty around the world. And our work and my role in it is a bit unique in that we don't actually just equip people to advocate like anyone else does. We actually train them to advocate uniquely as people of faith. And we like to say um, that we advocate, we want to advocate as if God is real and Jesus is risen um, because of the way that that would truly change how we speak and what we say, right? Um, and that foundation really changes kind of how we engage in advocacy. It changes how we understand our role in the larger work of God. Um, and so I don't know, I, I always laugh because I don't know about you, if you guys have any Christmas, if you just had Thanksgiving dinner, or if you have a Christmas dinner coming up, usually the two topics that we all get nervous about at the dinner table are politics and religion. And so you can kind of think of my role as that dinner conversation. <laughs> I live and breathe the tension of faith and politics. And so, um, I, I don't know, most people avoid it, but I'm just really steeped kind of in that, in the integration of those two things, and I love it. Um, because I think what that really means under the surface, and I think what that has to do with kind of why I'm here with you tonight, is um, because God has really convinced me that um, he is at work in every aspect of our world, and He's, he's at work in our own lives personally. He's at work in our relationships. Um, he's at work in the systems that we are all a part of, including our democracy, um, that serve us collectively. And so 
I believe, I think he's convinced me that his invitation is to us um, to participate in his redemptive work in the world that extends to all of those same aspects of life. Um, and so, you know, in that sense, the, the civic space that we'll talk about tonight a little bit, the process through which our policies are created that impact all of us, that's the mission field to which I personally feel called. Um, and I believe it's a realm that I think um, God wants all of us to engage in as well. So to get back to Kelly's question, um, my process to this point was not, it hasn't been a straight line, um, as I'm sure none of your stories have been either, right? God just doesn't tend to work that way. But for me, as I look back on the path God's brought me on, I think it looks a little bit more like um, a ripple in a pond, maybe, um, where it's like this ever expanding circle that started with discovering God, as Kelly said, as like a young teenager. Um, but the more I discovered um, who God was, the more that led me to discover more of the world. And that circle has just expanded. The more I discovered more of the world, the more I wanted to discover God in it. And so it's kind of been this never ending circle that's really just driven me um, to learn more about God in the world that he's created. And so um, early on in college, I, as, as Kelly shared, I kind of felt this call to full-time ministry, but um, my sense of what that was, was pretty narrow. And as I followed God into that call, um, he led me into the inner city. And that's where I really discovered the realities of, of poverty, of inequality, of injustice, really for the first time. And so after college, instead of, I was living in California at the time, and I was in the center, the center of the state. And so instead of heading south to seminary, where I had originally thought I would go, I headed north to the state capitol in Sacramento, and I worked for a state senator for three years. And the problem is, the more I learned more about policymaking and sort of this intersection of competing interests, um, the more I really yearned to understand God's like intent for all of it. You know, I think a lot of times we read the Bible as a personal thing. I knew how to interpret God's commands sort of for my own personal life, but I didn't know what that meant for making a law. <laughs> like, you know, at the time, the really big, the really big um, controversial topic of the day was like um, legal rights for immigrants, for example, whether they should have a driver's license or not, you know, and um, for, for uh, undocumented aliens. And so I remember reading scripture and thinking, well, God says to love the foreigner, but what does that mean when you're writing a whole policy? Um, and so I really kind of needed to regroup and understand a little bit more of like to get a theology that would ground me in that. And so that's when I ended up going to seminary. And um, so I, I, after a couple master's degrees, I ended up with more questions than answers, I think. And um, as these ladies can attest, um, and, and I sort of, um, I don't know, I packed up and I, and that's when I kind of connected with World Vision. I moved to Washington State. And so I've been working with World Vision for 11 years now. Um, but it's been cool to see how every circle is now being integrated in the work that I do. There's nothing that God has wasted um, in my journey. You know, Amanda, thank you so much for sharing that just with our viewers, because I, I noticed you left out one detail. And it was one of my favorites about your story. And that is that you're like, you know, you were seeing all, you know, really, I think curiosity, like, okay, where is God in, in policy and law and, and all these intersections you're beginning to see, because these laws directly affect the people I'm serving, you know, so I think I need to expand my, you know, curiosity a bit more wider now. But I loved how you said your application process, you know, could you maybe uh, mention the stats about that? And, um, just, you, you know, um, kind of kind of the pool of, of applicants, because I thought this, that was, as some might say, a God moment. Yes. Um, yes. So I grew up um, not as a political person at all. Um, the Central Valley of California is, it's known to be pretty conservative, but it's also known to be pretty moderate. Like people aren't super, I don't think it's quite the same as the East Coast. People are pretty pretty chill. They don't really tend to pay attention to politics a lot. That was at least my experience, my family. And, um, you know, here I was sort of, God was showing me some realities of my neighbors um, 
and, and some realities about the world and about global poverty that I was just discovering for the first time. And um, so I was wrestling with what, how does policy affect um, my neighbors? Like what, do, what, do, what does justice look like um, for them? So I can choose to live among the poor, which I felt called to do and live in these realities that are hard, but how do I, how do I seek anything to be different? Like what does it look like to actually affect change? And so I was starting to ask these questions about justice. Um, and I was a part of a program uh, at, at my college and the academic advisor sent out an email one day. Um, and I was, so I was scrolling through my email and uh, came across this fellowship at the state capitol. And I don't know about you, like when you feel the Holy Spirit stir something in you, um, for me, it kind of feels a little bit like a nervousness or an excitement or sometimes a flutter in my heart. And I got that with this email. Um, it was nothing. I wasn't getting a degree in political science. I wasn't looking like I thought I was going into full time ministry after college. And here I was getting this email about a Senate fellowship. Um, and I felt weirdly excited about it and interested in it. And um, I remember reading the, the brochure that came along with it. And it was like this fancy brochure that uh, talked, you know, it had quotes from previous fellows and literally everybody listed had political science degrees or double degrees from Ivy League schools. And I was attending like a state school. I, I was not like, I was not in a prestigious place. Yeah. And um, at the time, I really couldn't tell you the difference between a Republican or a Democrat. Truly, I don't think I knew. And um, here I was feeling like God said, Amanda, you should apply to this. <laughs> so I applied to it. And um, ultimately, I got the position, but I, it, I didn't know it at the time. In hindsight, I discovered that that year, 450 people applied for 18 slots. And here I was like, mm, I was going to the state school and I did not have a degree in political science. And there were, um, you know, there were, as part of the process, you know, you had to write an essay and whatever, and then you get to the next round and you had to go to the state capitol and um, for an in-person interview. And there I was, like, I literally bought a suit for this interview. I didn't own one. And I remember driving up to the state capitol. If any of you are familiar with, um, I mean, state capitals in general, California is beautiful. It's like this huge building from the 1800s. And there I was in like this ancient historic, like very formal committee room with a nine person panel of chiefs of staff and senior Senate officials. And I just remember being like, I am so out of place here. Like, this is hilarious. And um, they would ask me questions about policies. And I, you know, I, I took the approach of not lying. So there were many questions where I was like, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> um, and I remember there was one question that someone finally asked me and I guess I had mentioned like very briefly early on in the interview that when I was in high school, I became a Christian. And that was the extent of what I said. And this staff member um, toward the end of my interview literally said to me, Amanda, you mentioned that, at, you know, when you were in high school, you became a Christian. Would you mind sharing with us like how that changed your life? That was the question. And I remember just thinking as I, I said, okay, <laughs> I shared my testimony. Um, and I remember just thinking like, I left that interview, like I did not think I was gonna get the job, but I was pretty confident that I knew I had followed God to what the door he had opened for me. Um, and it turned out to be a lot more than that, but it's just one of those moments where, um, you know, God will answer your prayers and um, do more than you can ask or imagine. Um, and, and he'll surprise you if you're, if you're willing. I love that. And I just, oh, I love hearing your story and hearing about just the heart that you have for ministry and people and caring about people. And then the way that God will use so many different things and bring, bring people uh, into so many different uh, realms and areas. And just that, that you're able to live into such a neat calling and vocation in this place that is so hugely practical to just daily life. I just think of so much that gets done at the local level of politics. I mean, there's just 
so much important work that can be done and that that gets to be a way that you are living out vocationally, getting to engage with ministry um, and then putting your skill sets to work in such a practical way. Um, I just think that's so neat. So thank you for sharing just, yeah, the whole scope of that journey. And, and I also love just the way that where we think God's taking us isn't always where God's taking us. And, and even that we can have different seasons and different parts and just kind of, um, but like you were saying that everything gets used for God and for what God had in mind. I just, I love that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, one of the things that we have been talking about here a lot lately is the concept of shalom, um, God's peace, but it's so much um, deeper than just kind of a, a superficial um, idea of peace. And just as we had talked with you earlier, getting to hear um, about your work and just so much of um, just the idea of, of being a peacemaker in the world. So um, how is it that you define the concept of shalom? And then uh, how is shalom peace uh, connected to your work um, and your understanding of just uh, scripture um, and what God desires for us in our lives as Christians? Yeah, well, I love, I, I love that you guys um, want to talk about this concept. I'm really passionate about it. I think it's driven a lot of my own journey. Um, and I do think it's become um, more talked about in, in the evangelical space um, just in the last decade or so, which is really great. So it sounds like, you know, your church, um, I don't, some of you guys may know some of this already, but I just, the Hebrew word for shalom is like you're saying, it's directly translated as the word peace. But I just, I think that requires a bit of additional translation on our part. Um, to really overcome how we kind of naturally interpret that word peace in our culture, especially this time of year <laughs> um, with like Christmas songs. I just think uh, the, the word peace like really conjures up this, I don't know, I think of the song Silent Night, you know, all is calm and all is bright and we just long, we long for peace and quiet and we just typically think of peace as this absence of conflict or the absence of problem um, and, I, and that sort of gets it right. Like, I think the biblical concept allows for that, but the biblical concept of, of peace or of shalom in scripture, really, it's more than just merely the absence of strife or the absence of something. It's also the presence of something. And um, God really uses it to refer to this sense of wholeness and the sense of harmony and this sense of well-being. And um it's really built, I think, on this recognition that the break that occurred in the garden between Adam and Eve and God, it also really initiated a break from God in all things. You know, we're living in a world that is bent toward brokenness. It's bent toward strife. It's bent toward separation. And there's actually like a like the Bible talks about a power, you know, there's a pull that's working against our harmony and against our wholeness. And I kind of think about it almost like the image comes to mind about my magnets when they're kind of facing the wrong way and they're kind of pushed apart. Um, so I just think there's this invitation in scripture. Um, to, there, it's actually a command to us um, that is like to mark the very identity of the people of God is, um, you know, because we are made in his image, because he rescued his people from that brokenness, from slavery, from oppression, from being the outsider, um, we are now to bear that same image of him to the world. And so we're called to be people who reclaim and who preserve shalom in a broken world. We're to be the people who are repairing broken relationships. And what I love in scripture and what I, um, I sometimes forget is that it's not just a duty for us. It's actually the way of blessing. Like to be a peacemaker is the way of life. Um, God refers to it in Deuteronomy 30. You know, he says, I've set before you life and death, choose life. And so, um, you know, this concept of shalom, I think sometimes, you know, or if we hear about 
being a peacemaker. Jesus talks in the Beatitudes about, you know, bless are the peacemakers. It's like always this thing we put in our list of like, okay, I'm a Christian, so I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this and I need to do this and God wants me to do this. But really it's God's blessing for us. Like our best life are to be people who are focused on repairing brokenness in our world and repairing and restoring broken relationships. And so there's really, there's really no end to what seeking shalom can look like because we all know the brokenness in our world pervades, you know, all areas. Um, but I can give you at least a couple examples. Practically, I think getting practical is important. I can share at least a couple practical examples of what that looks like in my own life um, and my own work. Um, you guys have kind of mentioned the two kind of big areas where I live out peacemaking is kind of life in the inner city or among the poor in my city and also um, in the halls of power with lawmakers. And so um, I feel really passionate that that both of those things are about um, shalom and about peacemaking. Um, in my role with advocates and just in advocacy in general, um, there is you know, I think we can all acknowledge, especially at this time of year after a really tough election, um, our political system is built on broken relationships, um, not just in the two party system, but there, there, there is a broken, there's a disconnect between those who have power, whether they're in a place of political position or not, and those without power, right? There are people with more power in the world and there are people without. And so I see a lot of my life um, and our calling to engage in advocacy is really this, it's an opportunity to, to reconnect and to restore broken relationships between those who are in power and those who do not have as much power um, by bringing forward you know, in my role with World Vision, it looks like bringing forward the stories of those in global poverty and elevating their experiences and sharing their realities and actually inviting those in power to take steps on their behalf. That restores a broken relationship. That blesses God. That gives honor to God. That that helps um, the the created order look more like He intended it to be. Yeah, and just just to chime in, that totally reminds me of so many right of Jesus's life and His work and His mission is I love that you're reframing it in like restoring broken relationships because he's constantly when he heals someone or stops right saying hey let's not cast the stones right now you know um I think that's such a powerful moment he's like you know do you have a similar story as this you, you're also broken like this woman let's rather than right harming each other and you know do right giving into our human nature what does it mean to restore one another to each other um, and what you're saying just reminds me of what he constantly does. Yeah. And it's, you know, the challenge, I, I deal with this challenge too. And I think it's a, it's a lie that keeps a lot of us from engaging is that we look at our political system and we see the brokenness, like that's easy to see. We see the, um, we see the strife, we see the fighting, we see the arguments and the fear that it's based off of a lot. Um, and like the full redemption of that, we forget that that is not going to happen in this time, like in, the, in this world, like the full fullness of restoration will happen when God comes again, but he's invited us to work toward it now. And so it's like, God at, like we get to make a commitment to be a part of like smaller restoration in some ways it's, it's foreshadowing reconnection it's foreshadowing healing it's these little things that aren't going to be necessarily visible all the time in the big picture but that nonetheless worship god and give him glory and honor and that create that blessed light that bless us and so it's like when i can go and have when i can mobilize advocates you know to have conversations with their members of congress and to pray for them and to educate them about the needs of the poor around the world most you guys didn't know we were doing that like most people don't know that's happening but god sees it and it blesses him like that is what he wants from us and so there's this element of being willing to make peace and to restore brokenness even when it doesn't necessarily like restore the whole you know it's restoring like pieces of the whole um the other aspect i think of my just practically what it looks like to be a peacemaker in for my life is kind of in um where i live um so i live in the um i've since college have lived mostly in um lower income neighborhoods i currently live in 
um, the lower lowest income neighborhood in my county um, with my husband. And it's actually not, um, and my two kids. And it's not an inner city, which a lot of people think only poverty is like in the inner city. It's kind of like we're in the margins of society. Um, we're in what's called a food desert. Um, we're kind of like in between a freeway and a military base and not many, you don't go there unless you have to go there kind of a place. Um, but when I, another kind of transformative piece of scripture to me, for me when I was in college um, is from Jeremiah 29. And gosh, we, so many of us know the famous verse, you know, God says, I, you know, I, I, you know, the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, right? And we take that as this beautiful promise. But right before that, God is talking about shalom and he's talking about peace and he's talking to his people who are in exile and being, you know, sent into exile to a place they don't want to go. And he calls them to seek the shalom of the city that he has sent them to, that they don't want to be in, um, to, to seek the peace and the well-being of that city. He says, because in its well-being, in its shalom will be your well-being and your shalom. Um, and so, yeah, my, I've made a conscious decision and uh, my husband shares it. So we've lived with our family to, to live among the poor. And um, that's a calling that a lot of people don't understand or can easy to kind of seem like it's like the special thing. But um, to be frank, after experiencing a little bit, I quickly realized that this was not for the poor. Like this was for me. I need the poor. Um, and so there's an element about my own well-being and my own peace. Um, you know, my husband and I are talking right now about at a certain point, are we going to move? And the thing I wrestle with the most is just, man, when I drive like into my neighborhood every day, it is a cross-cultural experience. Um, and I, and I drive in and it is different from the world that I leave at my office or, or my work and, um, or I'm with my friends or where I do church. And I need that. Like, I need to see the realities that people are experiencing in my city. I need to see that they walk down the street in their pajamas. And I need to see them like carrying the groceries that they can fit in their hand because they rode the bus and that's all they can carry and they don't have cars. And I need to see that there are no street lights. And I need to see that there actually aren't sidewalks crossing over the freeway and that there are moms pushing their kids and strollers without a sidewalk and cars rushing past. I need to see all of those things. And I think so much about being a peacemaker or seeking shalom is to remember that it's not just about us like being these bear bearers of good news to other people, that is true. But there is so much that God has for us as we seek shalom and peace, it's for us too, it's for our well-being. And man, God has like changed me so much just because of where, you know, I've, I've lived and what he's able to teach me through my neighbors. That is so powerful. And I think the relationships are such, such a huge part and learning from being in community and learning from other members of the body of Christ, but maybe specifically those in the body of Christ who we don't always yeah, see every day at work and just really learning from the fullness of God's creation, how God is revealed in the world. As you were telling that story, it made me think of this amazing high school that I got to volunteer um, at for a while that is in a food desert. And, and I just, like you're saying, just these little everyday things that really pop up on your radar that you really wouldn't have thought of. Otherwise, I remember one day I had to bring a fruit tray to Bible study and had not even thought about which Safeway I'm going to stop off at and going to Safeway in a food desert and not being able, it was so overpriced and expensive and the food, like the fruit was just really kind of dry and old and me just sitting here and being like, this is my first time knowing what it's like to shop at a grocery store in a food desert. And why is this so different? And why is this fair? And, um, and I just think that it's that long-term investment. I mean, you're not, I was volunteering and, you know, I could volunteer once a week, but I mean, you're, you're living there. This is, this is your place where you're dwelling, like Emmanuel, God with us, God dwelling among us. And you have made your dwelling place in the space where you get to be in community with people who are showing you this world outside of sometimes these, these bubbles we get in. And I just think that is so powerful. 
and especially the fact that, that you've made this long-term commitment, because I think it's so easy to, to go in and do it a couple of times and be like, wow, my life was changed, but like living incarnationally in relationships, the type of change that happens there is just so, yeah. so cool. And to choose to put your, yourself, you know, and even your family in places where you know very rationally that you're not going to be comfortable you know, I think that's a choice that Christ calls us to all the time. And we're not even aware of it, maybe 50% or more of the time that, wow, Christ is putting an opportunity before me where I can choose like my comfort and to preserve that um, or whether God is nudging me to actually understand who he is in a new way. And what all stuck with me, and this was well over 10 years ago in undergrad, was a professor who I really looked up to and admired and wanted to be more like you know, um, told me, because I went to school in Southern California, very hot summers, told me to um, don't use AC and to drive with like, you know, drive with your windows down. And I remember he like ended one of his brilliant lectures with, you know, like, do you want to know how you can serve God? Don't like, and it wasn't, it wasn't about environmentalism or going green, or he was just like, pay attention to the people um, who in Southern California, there's a lot of fruit stands when you, you know, exit highway exits, right? So pay like, how, how do you think they are feeling standing there for eight hours and hundred degrees? You know, if you roll down your window, that is, you're practicing a little bit of empathy, not about like your own comfort, but actually getting to connect with these people to say hi, to dignify them, um, to make sure that you're not disconnecting from, right? from the world, from the grittiness of the world. And that all is stuck with me. So I think about driving with my windows up a lot these days. Yeah, or putting them down. Yeah. So kind of, you know, something that you've mentioned too is that I think people can get this, this idea of doing this is, it's so much, it's such a commitment. I mean, and even, you know, for you saying that you, you've chosen to live in these, these areas where you're living around poverty and people can kind of be like, oh, I could never do that. That's so, um, so, so when you look at um, being a disciple of Christ, what qualifications do you think of when you think of the qualifications to be a disciple of Christ or to be a peacemaker? And in particular, if someone doesn't quite feel qualified enough to be able to do that work, um, what, what, what would you say to them? Yeah. Oh, man, it's such a lie that, um, you know, that um, I know I even it's, you know, the older you get to the more the harder, like the bigger that lie is, because we just get stuck into our worlds and our centers of expertise. And we've gone to school for certain things. And we've gone on a track. And it's harder to kind of like, get out of that. Um, and we, we more easily, I think, let people, oh, that's what you're doing. We'll let you do that. And that's what you're doing. And you're going to do that. And there's, I mean, there's truth to that, but I do think there is an intentionality that, um, I know I need to keep up to like, keep, um, inviting God or following God, um, inviting God to lead me out of my comfort zone. But, um, you know, and as we think about what does it mean to be qualified, you know, the whole point of the cross, <laughs> like the very foundation of our Protestant theology is that there are no qualifications to follow Christ, right? We live in a, we are in a world, like if we are following Christ, that qualifications are done away with. Um, Christ fulfilled all qualifications on the cross and abolished the law because of the whole point is that we cannot, like none of us are qualified <laughs> before God, and so if we're looking to actually follow Christ, if you're on this webinar and you are interested in this concept of being a peacemaker and you're thinking, well, what does it mean? What does it look like? What do I need to do? I don't think the, the question is never, are we qualified? I think the question is only how can I position myself for the blessed life? Like, how can I experience the gifts that God desires me to experience? How can I have that life to the fullest that, you know, Jesus talks about in John 10? Um, and how can I then be the conduit of God's goodness to others in our world? So the, I think the question is more about how can you orient yourself or like position ourselves to be um, living the way of life that God, you know, offers us. And so I don't know. I think from my own personal journey, I, I would 
I would love to share what I think are kind of two orientations to help answer that question. Um, the first, I think that is just really critical that we've kind of been talking about is just an open heart. Um, the most dangerous prayer that, you know, the most life-giving but dangerous prayer that you can pray is I'm willing, um, is lead me. It's God interrupt me today. Um, it's the prayer that says, I, God, I wanna be where you are. I want to be a part of your work. Um, and I know, I know for me, I prayed that a lot more when I was in college. I don't pray that as much anymore um, now that I am settled, you know? And so I think um, we need to keep kind of reviving that prayer in our hearts. Um, and I think the most like, you know, my example for, from my own life, like a big one of that is, you know, the story I shared earlier about I, I was praying that prayer and there I was scrolling through my email and I got a flutter in my heart, right? God answers those prayers. Um, usually it's not like we pray that prayer and then we tell him exactly how to answer it. It's an open-ended prayer and um, God gets to come in and surprise us um, with those answers with either a conversation or a next step or an invitation that we weren't expecting and it just leads us then on a journey but he never leaves that prayer unanswered and so if you're looking to be a peacemaker or to become a peacemaker I would encourage you to start with that simple prayer and um, make it a rhythm like make it a daily thing in your life um, and it may not even feel sincere at first, quite frankly, like just do it as a check, check the box, like just do it. And eventually it will become sincere and God will stir your heart to make it more real in your life. Um, I think the second orientation that I, I think can put us in a place to be a peacemaker um, is, is a willingness to show up in the broken places. And I think that that's related to the first prayer, but I actually think it's harder to do because it will inevitably lead to pain. It will lead to discomfort and sacrifice and inconvenience because it requires that we discover like realities that we aren't currently aware of. And it will require that we actually face those realities. Um, and it's harder because I think it actually, if we're gonna show up in those broken places, it does demand that we actually engage as a learner first and not a fixer because we're gonna show up there not really knowing what's happening. And we're gonna need to learn what's happening before we can truly offer anything to it. Um, and so I do, I do fully believe that we can be peacemakers like right where we are. Um, wherever God has placed you, like in your marriage, in your family, in your workplace, in your neighborhood, I think that is all true. But I also really believe that we tend toward sameness. Like we tend toward comfort. We tend toward protecting ourselves from pain. That's kind of how we're bent. And I don't know about all of you guys, but I do a really good job of justifying my own comfortable and manageable life with the distance that kind of naturally exists between me and the broken hard places in my city or my world. There's like a natural distance that's there. And it's really easy for me to justify not being a part of the broken places because that distance is there. There are divisions that exist all around us mm -hmm. um, that I think really require like fierce, intentionality and faithful intentionality to overcome. There are divisions between financially stable people and those that are not financially stable. There are divisions between those with power and those without power, between the homeless and um, the sheltered, between married people and single people, or those with mental instability or those who are mentally stable and those you know, the religious and the atheist, the young and the old, the healthy, the sick, there is just, there's no lack of division in our world. And so what I think qualifies a peacemaker, um, in my opinion, is not a specific skill set 
or knowledge set because we all have those things. So if that was all that, that it required, like the world would be a lot more peaceful. <laughs> but what qualifies a peacemaker is an intentional choice mm -hmm. to cross a dividing line, like mm -hmm. to let go of your insider status and actually become an outsider in a new neighborhood or a conversation or a realm that you've never been in before. And that where there are like not many other people like you. So I think that's why we look for, like, I think that's why we ache for peace when we look at our world, because nobody wants to cross dividing lines. Like none of us instinctively want to be an outsider. It's a really lonely move without God. Um, but I just feel really convicted. Like this is the way of Christ. Um, I love Philippians chapter two, where Paul says, do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. And he says, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, that he already existed in the form of God. He did not consider equality with God something to hang on to, but he let it go. He emptied himself by taking on the form of a bondservant. And being born in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And so it's just, um, I think to become a peacemaker, it really does require this willingness to cross a dividing line and to become a learner in that new space. Um, but that will set you apart from like, no, not many other people are making that choice, but that's what's going to put you in the very position for God to use you to build peace and to restore those broken relationships. Wow. Amen. Yeah, that <laughs> engaging. Like, amen. Yeah, yeah. I, that just reminds me when you're talking about, I think that's such a powerful definition of being a peacemaker is making a willing choice, making that conscious choice um, to cross a dividing line and how uncomfortable that is how counterintuitive, how awkward that is um, to say like, man, society in the world tells me I probably shouldn't be here. Or I probably like, what am I doing showing up in, in this place in this way? Um, you know, you see that again, you know, Christ even being right, kind of pushed out of his community being like, okay, this is who you're going to be. We don't want you here right now. Um, you're, you cross the, you cross the line. Um, and I feel like that is, you know, you were talking about, it's, it's a part, you know, being a peacemaker, it's also about kind of undergoing this personal transformation in your life um, and truly being faithful to the call of God, which is right to go into uh, strange lands. And that often doesn't require a plane ticket. That's just the neighbor that's five minutes away or less, you know, or it can be a strange land can be a relationship. Um, it can be a coworker. It can be, um, yeah, your you know, yeah, your children's friends or who you, you're like, I don't understand this generation. That can be a strange land too. Um, so I just love how you also brought it home to the idea of sanctification, which is right. Moving from glory to glory, being made more like Christ requires that discomfort. And yet, you know, like discomfort doesn't mean like all agony or trauma or overwhelm or rejection. It's also is life-giving too. It's, it's this untapped well. Yeah, it does. It reveals more of who God is because um, even if we disagree with people, like we are all made in the image of God. Like <laughs> God is, um, God is possible to be present amongst all of us. And so um, I think the beautiful part is that when we cross those lines and we learn, we learn to see God in in someone else, in something different. In a, and and honestly, the truth that I can attest to is that the more broken place you are in, which I don't know how you define that, but you know you have them in your mind, like the thing that seems the most broken or the most difficult or the most far gone, like God is so much more at the surface in those places because there is no pretense anymore. And so, um, you know, even just, I mean, silly things, like recently, like scrolling through my Facebook feed and I'm like seeing some people in my life who are dealing with children with, you know, they're, they're caring for children with disabilities and dealing with really hard things. Um, and, you know, losing, you know, saying goodbye to their mother who's on hospice. And I'm just, I was reminded again of, 
because you know your first instinct is like oh I don't ever want to have to walk through that like I don't I don't want to bear that I can't believe they're going through that and yet the reality is the truth is that God is so present in those places in the brokenness like there's, there's no pretense, like he is there. And so as we're talking again, this invitation to be a peacemaker, like the bottom line is that it is for our good. Like it is the place of blessing. So if you want more of God in your life, run across that dividing line, get there. Like that is where God is show up. Like he is there waiting for you and it will bless your life. Even if you get there and you're like, I have no idea what to do. Great. Like you're in a good spot and you will meet with God. I love that. I think that's, again, countercultural, like in a universal sense, but also in a very contemporary present sense. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I hear it in my own family personally, um, just the, the how, la- how divisive language is and different beliefs, um, but also I see it in the church, you know, um, I see it's something we're wrestling with all the time. What do you mean cross the dividing line? You know, how we're conditioned and we don't often realize it. Um, just to, you know, we're told to stay within your lane. And sometimes that, that can be a wise thing to do, depending on the context that can actually be sage advice. Um, but also I think curiosity is such a, such a spiritual practice, um, to think outside of, of the bounds that, right, the world sets yeah. us. Are you saying there's some deceit sometimes in, um, in saying, you know, this, this is who I'm supposed to be in this alone. Um, you know, and I think God is so expansive in the way you look through Genesis to Revelation. God is always calling people and saying, hey, you want to do something unimaginable with me? you know, and um, saying yes, no wonder the angels are always saying, hey, don't be afraid, don't be afraid, but here's something crazy, you know, I'm going to like cross this dividing line with me, better yet, do it with God, because I'm here on God's behalf, Um, so I'm just curious if if Beth or Amanda, like, when have you recently crossed a dividing line, you know, um, doesn't, you know, sometimes we think it needs to be in this big radical way, but also I know, crossing a dividing line can also happen in very small everyday ways. Yeah, yeah. feel free to jump in first. I know I've been talking a lot. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, gosh, there's been so many ways. I just know, I love what you were saying about that prayer and asking God, um, God interrupt me today, because I know that like, I don't pray that prayer very often, but when I do like, God answers that prayer. And sometimes it's in the way that I'm just almost like, okay, I wanted you to answer that. I didn't want you to answer it that personally and have it hit that close to home. Like that's, I was thinking maybe you would like help my heart be open more for someone who's like a friend of a friend of a friend, not like, yeah. And God will just, you ask and God will just work in such powerful ways. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's been so many examples. I think maybe just one easily that comes to mind for me in grad school, there's just a lot of people from a lot of different backgrounds. And I found it so helpful in seminary to intentionally be in relationships with people who I know don't see things the exact same way that I am, because sometimes even, um, you know, in friend groups, you can kind of get around people who just, who, who see things very similarly to how you see things. And that's super helpful. Like, I mean, I really enjoy having conversations with, with people who see things the same way that I do, but, um, but yeah, I, I think a big part of being formed for ministry for me is regularly having conversations with people, you know, who grew up in different part of the country for me, people, you know, of different, uh, political, Uh, backgrounds as me I mean a huge variety of different things but I think I know a couple of people who we've just very intentionally chosen that we want to make sure that we are not just kind of staying with our own similarness um, of thought but really intentionally having conversations um, about things in a different way so I've just felt really grateful that in seminary I've I've been able to have those sorts of conversations and I always learn so much from them. You know, we have a question that I think really, uh, someone asked this question that totally touches on, Amanda, what you were saying and, and Beth about really, you know, connecting with people where you know the differences are there. 
And a uh, viewer asked, how do we move people out, out of comfort zones? Um, what does that look like? Whether as a friend, you know, it can happen in so many contexts, a friend, a coworker, as a leader, um, a parent, et cetera. How, how do we invite people to move out of their comfort zones? Yeah, such a good question. Um, I think I'm inclined to encourage us to um, move yourself, like focus on you, like be an example, move out of your comfort zone first. Um, as someone who's been involved in ministry too, I think um, so much of what I struggle to learn is to let God do his job, <laughs> you know, um, God will move others out of their comfort zones. Um, and I think the, the, I've just seen the power of example um, to really show people what it can look like and to show people that God will bless and um, move and provide rich richness um, to life when you move out of your comfort zone. So I think that's one thought that comes to my mind. Um, but, I, but also practically speaking, like in my job, we are constantly trying, we're attempting to move members of Congress out of their comfort zone um, to take action on policies that aren't politically popular or that their constituents are not really asking them to take action on. And there's a lot, you know, um, there's a concept that has been just really transformative for me um, as we've trained our advocates. Um, you know, when Jesus sends out his disciples, um, to go preach the good news of the kingdom. He tells them to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. And what that tells us is that for Jesus, there are different kinds of power. There mm -hmm. is the wisdom of the world. There is the wisdom of serpents. And he says, you go for it. You use that. But there's also the innocence of doves. And that means that there is like a different kind of power that God can use, that we have access to as people of faith. And I think um, so much of the time I try to just do things in my own power, mm -hmm. um, but God's power, if I, if I invite it in, God can do things that I am not capable of doing. And so when we, practically speaking, like when we're advocating with members of Congress, yeah, we use, we use serpent power. Like we, we have our talking points and we have our handouts with pictures and we have our clear ask and we like can make our case about why it will help benefit them to take whatever action we're asking. But we also use our dove power. And that means that like, if you look throughout scripture, God communicates and moves people and moves leaders in ways that are kind of strange. Like, have you read the prophets? <laughs> Um, and he speaks to like, I always get confused. What's the left side and the right side of the brain, but you know what I mean? He speaks to our hearts, not just our heads. Mm -hmm. And so whether you're taught, whether your question was posed in terms of like, how do you move people power or just the church or whatever? I think the principle is the same. It's that, um, God, it, there's, I don't have time to get into it, but it's like, God uses examples of stories. Like he, Nathan used a story to convict David and that story and that imagery, like David wasn't getting it until he heard the story. And then he was like, oh, you're talking about me. <laughs> um, uh, God uses like icons or um, pictures or imagery to move us. Um, that's the prophets were sort of living icons. They were having to like do things physically with their bodies to communicate a message. Um, God speaks through his truth. So and God also like people are moved. A lot of times we think about how to get people to do what we want to do or want them to do. But really, um, like, I don't know, like God, God can, um, a lot of times we don't do things just because we're scared. And so the question I think sometimes is like, how do you give people courage? The word encouragement is literally to give courage to somebody. So how can you give somebody the courage um, or the love or just the support that they need to take that step of faith? Mm. I love that you ended on that note of courage. Like, you know, sometimes uh, encouragement, right, is to give, yeah, to give people courage to say, yes, you can. And how often I think that's the message of, right, the verse that, right, God's love, you know, like it's perfect love casts out fear, right, um, and, and enables us to act. Um, but also I think that, you know, God's power is made perfect in our weakness, you know, and um, that always comes to mind when I'm like, what am I doing in this situation? Or how did I get myself here? Or, 
this is actually isn't a good idea after all. I'm not brave enough. I'm not qualified enough. I'm too old. I'm too young. I'm too this. I'm too that. You know, comparison not only is a thief of joy, but it also can serve us a lot of lies. Yeah. But just to say, okay, God, you know, if you're present in this, then it's going to be more than okay. Yeah. Um, and I think that's so powerful to give give ourselves permission and to help encourage others, literally like encourage and to give each other courage um, in what you just said. Um, and we had a uh, one, someone comment to uh, earlier that uh, they'd love to see you on January 20th, um, like in the middle of the aisle to help parties come together and do meaningful work. Someone said, Amanda needs to be, needs to be in DC. So you've got some fans okay, out here. In to be guys, they won't. <laughs> Well, um, thank you so much, Beth, for moderating and asking such thoughtful questions. Thank you, viewers at home, wherever you may be watching, for tuning in tonight. And for those of you who are watching um, in the archived section of our website, thank you so much uh, for also joining us for this conversation and leaning into being a peacemaker. And Amanda, thank you um, just for your work and your ministry and uh, the example of of what it means to be a peacemaker in real ways um, at home with your two kids and, and right where you are in Tacoma in, in your neighborhood. Um, it is such a gift to get to talk with you and to learn from you. And uh, God bless you and all that you're doing because it is uh, such a witness, yeah, to the life and ministry of Christ. Thank you. So thank you everyone. Yeah, thank you everyone for tuning in and have a wonderful night and God bless you. We'll see you again. We're taking a break in January. Uh, but we'll see you back on the first Monday in February. All right. God bless you. Take care.